uh, are that both of them have been um, uh, you know professors uh, and academics for a long long time and then you know gone on to being uh, successful uh, people in the corporate world uh, and the common theme between them and me is that i was a bad student so uh, with that we want to talk about decision sciences uh, quickly the the pattern you know the, the structure that we'll follow for this conversation is that we'll quickly set the stage up in the first 5 minutes and then we'll talk about each trend and as we talk about a trend we we'll let vijay and dr werner speak about you know their thoughts on that trend uh, and then hopefully we'll synthesize that and eventually we'd like to keep about 10 10 to 15 minutes for questions from you guys so um, you know the the thought process that we had quickly was you know why you know what and how what are the predictions that we think are important and that's where we'll spend most of the time and and then how you can leverage this and that's where you guys can ask a lot of questions at your end um very quickly right we all appreciate the fact that in in today's world we are seeing a tremendous amount of explosion in data and you're seeing that all across you data is doubling every 18 months cost of memory is becoming cheaper and cheaper computing power is increasing on a continuous basis all of this means that there is a nice virtuous cycle between data applications analytical techniques and technology the other thing to keep in mind is the changing face of the problem space as such the face of the problems that we are seeing that need to be solved either from a services company or from a product company or a company in between those two is quite you know the changing face is something which is uh, things are changing quite quickly now if you i want to introduce one paradigm to you guys and this paradigm is that if you take all the problems that exist in the world and see how frequently they occur and how how much in, and the other dimension being how much impact that they make you will see that uh, there are problems that don't occur with a tremendous amount of frequency and don't create that much impact and i call it the barren desert of low return nobody wants to solve these problems right there are problems that occur with a tremendous amount of frequency you know be it, uh, and make tremendous impact be it search be it uh, you know options trading in uh, on a stock exchange all of these land in a space which i would call uh, the fertile lands of disproportionate return these are problems that everybody wants to solve but you know what is interesting for me is that there is a space in between the two which actually is not as sexy pardon my french here and doesn't get noticed as much which is the river of reasonable return and we think that that is the river of reasonable return that one you, you need to look at uh, as you are thinking about you know interesting things for the future now we think that the world of decision sciences and analytics i don't like the word word analytics as much i like the word decision sciences a lot more uh you are solving problems using a mixture of art and science you are solving the problems using the algorithmic features and you are using heuristics to solve those problems algorithmic meaning you know less you know less brained routine process oriented you know a lot more technology gets used in that heuristic meaning right brained judgment based more complex multi input multi output now in this world if you look at the problems that are occurring in the uh, in the high frequency domain they are more algorithmic the problems that are occurring in the high impact low frequency domain there are more heuristic our perspective is that it is where the these two currents meet is that's going to be the interesting place to solve problems at you're going to see the it paradigm being used to create products from services as you create products you're going to see the it paradigm being used in places where a lot of algorithmic is happening and you're going to see the consulting paradigm being used a tremendous amount in places where you know it's 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 low frequency high impact 
our perspective, but there are exist other paradigms where you can mix these two and uh, come up with you know new ways of assetizing and productizing. Um, so this gives you a perspective of how various domains have evolved. In marketing, you see that things were extremely heuristic initially. They went on to become you know algorithmic more and more. Marketing in 1960s was more an art more than anything else. Today, it's not as much of an art. It's getting to be a little bit more of a science. Eventually, tomorrow, there's going to be a balance between the art and the science. Supply chain was done mostly by engineers. Supply chain was far more of a science before uh, and, and less of an art. You know, today it's having some amount of art in it, and eventually there'll be, you know, a mixture of art and science. So the big message here is that you have to think of art and science, left brain and right brain together. So our perspective is that our perspective is that you know how do you you know how do you the way you think about decision sciences how do you think about it we think of it as you know what is you, this word called business intelligence is quite old and has been used quite a bit right we think of decision sciences as descriptive inquisitive predictive and prescriptive descriptive meaning what happened in the business inquisitive why something happened in the business predictive what will happen and prescriptive the so what now what we think all four of these things have to be used together to make decision sciences work now we believe that a combination of math business and technology is going to be needed to make decision sciences and analytics work business plus technology to a large extent has made it happen business plus math has made consulting happen Math plus technology has resulted in interesting product companies, be it Google, be it i2, so on and so forth. We think the future lies in a world where you will use math, business, and technology and combine with that behavioral sciences. So that's where we think the world is heading. A combination of math, business, and technology. Applied math, applied you on interesting, relevant business problems leveraging technology so let's talk about the predictions and let's see where we think you know where we think the world is going and how you know what chandru and uh, dr warner think about each of these things so the first thought being that as analytics and decision sciences is getting used more and more you will see a tremendous amount of hyper competition people will want more and more for less and less people will use information arbitrage far more businesses will use analytics in every way possible and it cannot you cannot live without touching analytics in one form or the other so the governor being in amazon.com that's a business where you guys think analytics and decision sciences is very core to your business i mean your ceo writes uh, in your letter to shareholders he talks about analytics so so what would you say about this well for some has been a, has i mean it has had an analytics core to all of its operations from the beginning that amazon is a technology company at heart yeah not necessarily a retailer as many many may see it um i think whether whether it is competition driven i don't think amazon and I, being competition focused can be a good business strategy but i honestly believe and that's what we believe at amazon is that we have to be customer focused and the only way to really understand whether you're delivering the services for the customers that you want to deliver is to measure because that's the only way to get insight into uh, what your customers are doing and i think this is a pattern that we definitely see in many younger businesses coming back as well you know the whole lean approach where you know you cut away as much waste as possible really focus on the customer measure what they are experiencing and then continue to iterate to drive your business to be, be better it's not a stop gap it's not like standing still and just understanding your customer it has to be the input in driving to do better for your customer and in that sense now amazon is not competition focused we are customer focused and we use our analytics to drive better service for our customers and i think that's sort of the the, the difference there. I think if you look at many young businesses to follow sort of the lean startup model, it's exactly the same thing. There is no young business that starts today that doesn't start with analytics 
from, from the get-go. Because they often start off with a minimal viable product and they quickly iterate that product in the direction where their customers want to take it. The only way to do that is to measure and to analyze what your customers are experiencing and then drive that, help that drive your product in the direction where they need to go. Vijay, any thoughts on this? Um, yes, um, <coughs> but first, before I um, talk about this hyper-competition, let me just say that, uh, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, I also want to point out that this problem of uh, data and analytics and so on uh, is even more compounded in the sciences. Data is doubling roughly at every six months. Wow. Uh, for example, in biology and, um, and you know, Amazon uh, is the repository of a lot of that data. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it, um, in science it's almost becoming a bottleneck. Uh, this is called the fourth paradigm of science, uh, is what Microsoft guys call it. Uh, but everywhere you're seeing that data intensity in science is, is, is actually holding up progress. Uh, now, as far as this, uh, uh, this particular topic is concerned, I think decision sciences uh, can be applied at a strategic or a tactical or an operational level. I think it's, it's, not, it's primarily at the operational level that you will see, you know, the kind of frenzy that, that you are talking about. I think... Um, we love that frenzy. Yeah, <laughs> particularly, say, in fast-moving consumer goods, uh, marketing, and so on. And uh, I remember uh, my teacher, John Little, at, at the Sloan School, used to say that uh, the uh, barcode scanner is like the electron microscope for marketing. Right? And uh, so, so really, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of parallels between, between science and, uh, and uh, uh, analytics in science and analytics uh, in, in business. But, uh, but I, I think this is an issue that will affect at the operational level, but, but there's still a lot of analytics that needs to be done at competitive analysis levels and so on, which, which I think will still be very specialized and Sure. And not so fanatic. Right? If I look at, you know, if you look at common patterns that are happening at the moment, if you look, I mean, there's an increasing competition, there's an abundance of products coming into the market. I mean, where 10 years ago, enterprises could predict the success, for the, the success of their products because they had locked their customers in for a very long time. That's no longer the case. Um, the, the power of the consumer today, whether it's the individual consumer or whether it is the, the, the consumer within the enterprise, um, has completely changed the landscape of how products are being uh, uh, acquired and who is the decision maker in this process. So do you think the, this power is shifting more towards the consumer as decision scientists is happening? I, I, I don't, I'm not really sure whether it's actually the, the decision scientist that is driving that. It is the fact that the consumer starts to understand that he's in control. I mean, we all software professionals here, mostly for you work for maybe enterprise vendors or, or for enterprises in themselves. We see a whole new group of leaders coming within the enterprise that are used to a very different way of acquiring software. Sure. Yeah? They, are, they, they have uh, rich tablets, uh, uh, phones, on which they will swap out uh, an existing application for another application. It's something that they just paid $5 for. This is one that's slightly better. They'll pay $6 for it and throw the other one out. They are used to having complete control over their software environment. That is something that is completely different from 10 years ago where basically the IT department that decided what the software was. Yeah? Sure. And so in that sense, if you're an enterprise software vendor, it's way more important to be really close to your customers and understand whether you are building the right things for them because otherwise, they'll be walking away and they're going to your competitors. Licensing models are completely changing, completely revolutionizing. It is now in the hands of the consumer to actually decide what services and what software they're using instead of that it's the long-term commitment to one particular vendor that we that. Fascinating. You know, uh, so, so, so synthesizing that, what you're saying is that the, the in free information flow has led, led to a higher democratization uh, of, of the whole decisioning system. Yeah. Uh, but also for, I think, as vendors of software, uh, you have to be really close to your customers and really understand how your customers are using your software or your services to be able to really deliver the absolute best service because that's where the competition is going to go about. Whether you are delivering the best service, not whether the guy next to you is doing the same thing. Sure. Because 
one thing that was changing, and I, last time I was in India, I talked to um, the CEO of a very large um, SI, the system integrator, and he said, well, you know, you guys with the cloud kind of killed it for us. <laughs> our, comp our competitive strategy used to be we would acquire any major competitor that we would encounter. And that would be how we would control the competitive landscape. Now cloud has completely democratized the whole business creation process. If I acquire one, five years later, there are ten others. Sure. Yeah? And so these ten others means that if you continue to be focused on your competitors, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You have to focus on the customer, okay. measure what's important for them, and follow that strategy. Wonderful, wonderful. So I want to shift to the next point, right? So this, this thought that companies, will companies continue to folk, you know, compete just on the creation of analytics and decision sciences, or would they move to competing rather on the consumption of analytics and decision sciences? And let me just, you know, paraphrase this a little bit, right? The creation of analytics and decision sciences is just, you know, making the dashboards happen, making the reports happen, coming up with the predictive models, figuring out what the right answers are. But the consumption of analytics and decision sciences to a large extent is communicating better between the various business units, aligning incentives, implementing better, you know, developing cognitive repairs for cognitive biases that human beings have, walking the aisles inside your corporate, you know, uh, in your corporate hallways, and making things happen from this is from from information to insight to act, you know, uh, to action. So, where do you see this evolving? Do you see this evolving to a place where people will compete just on the creation, but or what move on to competing on the consumption of analytics? And you know, Dr. Werner, your perspective, given that Amazon is such a big, has a you know, has taken a such a strong perspective on this. Um, so I think that you know, it's not only concern. I mean. As a company like Amazon, where you know understanding your customer behavior is core, you cannot only you have to own the creation of data analytics. Yeah. Um, although we've, we've always shied away from actually making this another um, a revenue channel for us. Um, we have seen many young companies, as I talked about earlier, that start off with actually collecting data and uh, data and do data analytics to drive a better, a better customer experience. But it often at the same time start looking at that, that data stream as an additional revenue stream at the same time. Yeah? Um, a, a good example is a, a young company I just encountered is SoundCloud. They're in, New York, they're in Berlin and New York. They do uh, basically just, it's a platform where musicians can share their music and they do all sorts of analytics. So it sounds like a music company, but in essence they're an analytics company. They analyze what, what, which of your uh, listeners are actually liking what music, for the musicians, they analyze what are what are the other trends that the music that the that uh, the listeners are going through, and they have an additional revenue stream towards uh, music labels where they inform them about new trends, about new interests. So it's not only improving customer service, but you can see this as a as a secondary revenue stream as well. Amazing. And what about in the life sciences world? Right. Yeah. So this? what was running through my mind when I uh, heard that is uh, really sort of the culture and pharmaceutical industries, for example, um, where, uh, of course, there's a lot of analytics, particularly in the early stage of discovery. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I, and I think pharma pharmaceutical companies are, uh, have had the luxury of being extremely picky about the quality you of the You mean the margins? Because of their margins, <laughs> right? They've, they've had uh, incredible profit. So, uh, in some sense, uh, when they in license a technology, it's it's always has to be the best of best, right? And uh, and so uh, clearly there, the pharmaceutical companies, you know, because for them, finally, it's a question of whether you found that nugget or that diamond, uh, you know, in the rough, right? And so uh, so so it's it's very very important that they use absolutely the best tools that are out there. And so, and their competitive edge comes from that. So, so, so can so, I actually ask you a question yeah. about that? Because um, you know, one thing I see with, with you know, the increasing competition is that time to market gets compressed. But right. time to market in life sciences is still 10, 15 years at times. Do, do you see the same compression right. in time to market there? 
Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of problems with, with those sand lines, and, and as you can see, many of the pharmaceutical companies are going through a little bit of a, of a, uh, of a tsunami pressure almost mm. because, uh, because their pipelines are not rich enough and, uh, and you know. But uh, they, uh, fortunately, there's always a, a pecking order. That is, there'll always be agile young biotech companies that will make the discoveries and then pharma companies will just gobble them up and uh, so, so there's, there's sort of a, a, a food chain there. Um, so, so what you'll see is more say, professors at Cornell and so on who, uh, who, who will jump in to discovery, spin out a biotech, take, take that molecule a little bit further and then get acquired by, by Pfizer or Merck. So, I mean, that, that model has been tried and tested. And, and I don't think so, so one of the things that we are seeing, Vijay, yeah. is that, you know, there is a preclinical part of analytics, which is very science-oriented. And there's a post-clinical, uh, you know, uh, you know post -com pre compliance and post-compliance. Compliance and, yeah, yeah. Compliance So the pre, uh, you know, pre-compliance is very clinical trial-oriented and all of those things, right. which is scientific. The post-compliance is more commercial. We are seeing that interplay between that also coming quite a bit now in companies, where companies are asking for that interplay, where can you understand more about your molecules and therefore know, uh, you know, hey, which of these drugs are going to come and uh, how do I plan for my sales force two years from now? How should I plan my training regimen two years from now? Because that's going to be a competitive advantage if I have all of them. Right, yeah. So certainly I think more about agility and having sure. having that uh, the deeper analytics and um, now the, the overlap comes in several places uh, for example I think uh, more and more now you will find that in personalized medicine you're, you're going to see the connections from bench to bedside sure. happening uh, you know much more and today you already see it in cancer genomics for example and, and how cancer patients are treated and so so you know, uh, clearly, then the science is going to going to have a much uh, sure. stronger role, even even at at, uh, at the very regulated sort of hospital level. So I want to give a, take an interesting phenomenon, right? If you look at the P multiples of companies over the last you know 10, 15 years, you see that anything that is disruptive is getting a far bigger multiple now than before. Is it because information is free flowing so much? that incremental innovation is happening on a continuous basis and therefore disruptive innovations are going to become rarer and rarer. Are we seeing a phenomena where because we have so much data, you're going to have less creativity because your imagination is going to be less used? This is probably a very uh, you know, uh, controversial way of putting it, but is creativity going to become an asset that fewer people will own in the future? What do you think, Dr. Bernard? Uh, so first of all, I don't think these two things are in conflict with each other. Um, I don't think if incremental innovation will become routine, that, that that means that um, you know big innovations are suddenly disappearing. Sure. I think um, you know if you can make if you can use data to support the decisions that you're making, you would be silly not to do that. Sure. Yeah. I mean that's that's kind of like you know you have you have it laid out for you. Even it can be complex, but you know you have to use the data that's important. If you to uh, understand that the data is actually the complete data set that you sure. to be looking at. Um, so at Amazon we, we have indeed two levels of innovation. Each, each team at Amazon is charged with innovating on the particular service that they are delivering, whether that is recommendations, whether it's uh, the supply chain, whether it is um, any, any of those services. And uh, that's not driven, there's, there's no control by higher level, the higher level says, the higher level of the company says, and this is what you should be doing. Each of those teams is driven with continuously innovating on behalf of the customer and making it better for the customer. Uh, it can be small things, it can be big things. Um, but on the other hand, I think if we look at what Amazon has delivered in the past four or five years, uh, you know, we're, we're one of the pioneers in cloud computing. We, we do fulfillment with Amazon, we do we have a Build a whole ebook infrastructure ecosystem. Um, uh, we delivered workflows as a service. There's so many big innovations that come out of Amazon. And the fact that we do continuous small innovation hasn't bothered at all to do these big innovations at the same time. Right. So I don't think those two things are at Mutually all exclusive. Inclusive. Yeah. Okay. From a, you know, you know, I, I want to shift topics a little bit and talk about you know new data sources. 
do you think you know uh, vidai that as the world is you know moving towards uh, you know this world that you have know, seen so much emphasis put on decision science analytics data big data i mean big data uh, is like uh, i would say in the bollywood like kapoor or khan if you don't use the word big data twice in a single day you you feel that you are you are out of place uh, i just walked in and five people asked me what you know i i am a big data provider wow you, it's good for you but uh, what do you think from from that perspective of new data sources are you seeing that in in the in the domains that you're working on uh well you know uh, data actually uh, sort of content business as 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 we call it um has um, has you know sort of mixed uh, mixed reviews in the sense that um uh if you have the right data organized in the right way at the right time it can be hugely valuable right uh but it's very typical that that's very ephemeral and that that value erodes very quickly sure. because you know other people come up with competing products uh, and in the life sciences in particular a lot of data is open and is actually public and uh, and so content businesses including many of your curation companies that came up in india uh, have generally run into this problem that that uh, pretty soon the value of those databases erodes and, and uh, they're not able to to do very well i notice that you have recorded future in your list of companies there that's a very interesting company um, as you know uh, the founders uh, you know uh, were actually the founders of spotfire which uh, which chipco acquired for about sure. 150 million dollars so um, uh, so chris uh, uh, who started this uh, is now doing something very different but uh, i don't think it's really this business is about content as much as it is about surveillance so sure. so so it's um uh so i you know i i i'd say that the content business has sort of uh, has a mixed uh, history um and um, you know of course there are players like thomson reuters and so on who have really learned how to make make a very scalable and sustainable business out of it but but it's uh, it's a tough business to get into uh, you know for for Dr. Warner yeah. oh, I do think that you know what we see happening is that um, most analytics is not taking place on one data stream anymore um in general it's taking in many different data streams and products are being built on on that way as well where it has public available information so if you look at the US the government has made all governmental data available mm-hmm. so data.gov is a, is a portal run on um run in the cloud of course um for which you can get access to all of the different data sources that the government offers um uh, the UN has i think 195 different databases there is now one portal to one API for which you can get access to all of that data um and so there's many different data sources uh, arising for which the, the for which they are combined um nasdaq um uh, originally launched an application on top of a of, of the amazon web services that is providing um, an, a, an application that did market um a historical market analysis uh, but they realized that all the data that they've been storing in the cloud actually others could actually build much nicer applications or could aggregate that data with other data sources providing a very advanced analytics and so they decided to open up that data in a for pay uh, uh, model of course but you know if you're so there's a mixture of for pay and as well as uh, freely available data now i think what we are what we are seeing already is the the new style of applications that are being developed have a very rich applications that often pull together data from many different data sources uh, even consumer applications you will get data from geolocation environments but not only where you are but what's the weather around what's the traffic condition um you will combine that with information about uh, your social graph um and again there's again other real time data sources many of these data sources coming together uh, combining these services and um, running them in an environment then um, where you can actually serve that to multiple platforms at the same time absolutely so i think one thing we are seeing is that transform you know data which is transformed uh, for example i just read yes i think two days ago that fico is coming up with scores for adherence to 
taking medicines, uh, you know, health index, very similar to your credit sc score. Uh, so I think it will be a, you know, very soon we'll have new forms of data to come up. Uh, let's talk about as a CT, as the CTO of Amazon, right? Uh, the role of this new role, I mean, the CIO role got created in the last 15, 20 years. Do we, are we going to see the role of the chief analytics officer? We are seeing as we work with multiple clients uh, in across a variety of domains that this role is played by very interesting people. You, here you see, you know, um, uh, people with uh, backgrounds in digital risk, people with backgrounds in experimental psychology, n neuroscience, cognitive experimentation, people with backgrounds in engineering, all of these coming up and playing the role of head of consumer insights or uh, you know, the chief analytics officer, the chief data officer, do you see that trend continuing? I know Yahoo has or some of IAD, you know, wh what do well, you think, think about that? I think that the, uh, this is proliferation of C-level uh, jobs. You don't so want I'm any more C-level jobs. I'm not necessarily convinced that that, that <laughs> really delivers, <laughs> that result is being okay. used in myself. You know, okay. uh, but but more, more importantly, I think analytics as well as data, both of them are, I think those are the processes, those are not, the, the things that they should deliver. Uh, in my eyes, this should be the CIO, but we've used that title already for, for another task. But we should be a chief information officer, because that's actually a chief decision officer, or, uh, or maybe chief economics. Um, because that's actually kind of the role that they play in the organization, and it is just a process. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, so if I, yeah, I might just add, um, I think on this uh, chief analytics officer, uh, from a services point of view, it might be actually very nice to have a new person to go to. Uh, actually, and, no. <laughs> and, you know, the chief information officer has uh, got used to commoditizing uh, IT services. Sure. Whereas, uh, you know, the analytics officer might actually give you more. Sure. Value. Okay, right, uh, maybe you should rename the CIO to the chief procurement officer. But, yeah, you know, the, the actual uh, analytics, the senior developers and uh, product managers who, uh, who are around uh, in, in, in companies like, uh, uh, that are very successful, I think, are actually the key, much more than the, the, the chief analytics officer. And in fact, one of the things we really have to learn in India is for people to stay technical for longer, right? I, I, you know, I think many of our developers look to become managers far too early. I call them damagers. <laughs> and uh, and it, it, it would be great to have, you know, 50-year-old developers uh, and product managers uh, you know, still staying in a very technical role because I think there's a huge value that you can provide to your organization. Yeah. Okay. Actually, the CTO, the guy who was CTO before me at Amazon, is now a developer at Amazon. Oh. Wow. So I'll say it's a company and I really, you know, and I hope to actually become a developer, go back to developer yeah. later on because I think you cannot do this job if you do not have a really good um, uh, connection with the core base of what you're actually trying to provide. You're not an executive. You, if you do not really understand the, the size of the business that you are representing. Wow, that's amazing. You know, one thing that we are seeing is analytics education. I just got a call from somebody at Northwestern University saying that, hey, you guys, you know, are creating so much talent in analytics. Would you want to partner with Northwestern University and help us create a master's in sciences in analytics? Uh, we are seeing that across five or six schools right now. McKinsey Global Institute had a report which basically said that we are going to be shot by 200,000 data scientists by, uh, uh, you know, by 2018. So do you think that analytics of uh, education needs to get formalized? Do you think that, you know, you need to have a master's in, you know, decision science? Well, I think every 30 years you need a new name, right? <laughs> I think uh, probably in the 60s, we call it cybernetics and systems theory or systems engineering. Uh, you know, in the 80s, it was operations research and AI. And uh, maybe, you know, in the 10s, uh, you, can, you can have a, a new degree in analytics, right? So but it's always the same old wine and I, I would, in, I, you in know, let me, bottle. Let me, right. Sandhu, let me say this. You know, how many of our engineers really, really appreciate math? 
uh, well, the way math is taught uh, in engineering schools, I think, is really as a cookbook uh, subject. Is, you know, you're not really taught to think from scratch. Sure. Actually, you know, you'll find that physicists are actually trained much better. Sure. So I think, you know, but I think you should take a global view of this. Right? Right. So the US maybe is like, like India in that market it used to be underappreciated. But I think that starts much earlier than, than universities. Sure. If you look at Eastern Europe and if you look at China, math is being considered to be the absolute most important basic skill that you should be able to learn. And I mean this is calculus level math, that is not this level underneath. Uh, although I do think that the IITs do a really good yeah. job actually in training their engineers as a really good core fun fun fundamental. Absolutely. So again, uh, you know, guys, if you if you have an eight-year-old or a ten-year-old, do the math. Okay. So uh, actually, I want to uh, come back to, to this one because I think that on one hand, yes, there is the, the way to produce specialists in this area. They are absolutely necessary. But I actually want to come back to a point that was made earlier about the fourth paradigm. So fourth paradigm is shifting from sort of computational science where we did predictive modeling into data-intensive science. This is the term coined by Jim Gray originally. But this really means that actually it's not just a uh, business that is changing in terms of analytics. It is also um, um, sciences like history, sciences like psychology, that are all changing into becoming data-driven sciences. And so how do you teach psychologists to be better uh, both data collectors and data analysts? Because it's not just that you need to have specialists for that. I mean, how do you teach a historian to actually uh, understand how his or her science is completely changing and becoming, instead of an observational science, becoming a data-driven science. Very insightful. And so you need to have a broad education, a broad understanding of data, of the importance of data and analytics across all, all verticals in, in science. So, you know, Chandru, your company, in a way, helps analytics by creating, by helping practitioners of analytics become better by having a tool around it. I know it was done for the life sciences, but it can go across various domains. Do you think that an process automation in analytics will take place far more? How are you seeing that trend taking place? Right. So our big challenge was to make analytics accessible to biologists. And biologists, by and large, are not trained, for example, in mathematics in, in, in many countries. And uh, um, so, uh, in fact, the, the final solution we came up with was essentially uh, the 80-20 rule, right? So you find canned workflows that actually cover 80% of the uh, of the you know use cases, so that uh, the biologist can then just you know step through the workflow and arrive at at, a, at an anal analysis that is statistically correct and uh, and is able to then uh, go go on to their publications, but. Uh, the uh, the challenge uh, there is to architect your software in such a way that these workflows are easy to create, easy to change, and as as your uh, data inputs change, you're, you're able to adapt. And that comes down to more computer science issues of modularity and 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 the right kind of architecture. So so this uh, so that's been our our challenge. There. But I think that the the level of automation there really also means that you can. There's no, there's no longer a need for humans to be in the loop. I mean, yes, it's okay to have the dashboard and to look at them, but there's no, there's no need for a human to look at the dashboard and then take action. I think for many of these areas, people really know, I mean, take simple examples, take, take recommendations as, as Amazon. There is no human in the loop that says, yeah, this seems like good recommendations to give. It's a completely automated process. Um, we have, if you look at the front page of Amazon, there's sort of nine fields that are very dynamic, the king of the hill algorithms there, where these, uh, where about 200 different campaigns fight for these nine different spots continuously, and you can make that a completely algorithm and data-driven environment. There's no need for a human to be in the loop there. Anymore. Sure, sure. So, you, uh, uh, being, you know, a big propagator of the cloud, you know, uh, do you think the open source in analytics and decision sciences is going to going to play a big role and in the democratization of this field more. What is the trend that you're seeing in how, you know, how the cloud is being adopted by CIOs? Are they scared? What is happening? So, uh, 
So if you look at our business, you would probably conclude that CIOs are not fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, think, um, I think the advantages that this is shifting, we are able to do analytics at scale without actually having to put any capital at front is, is a completely radical thing. And not just simple an an analytics, you can do, I mean, there's companies that create 3,000 core uh, ap applications to do uh, protein folding. And we provide not only, let's say, the, the standard server environment, but also high-end HPC nodes, HPC nodes with uh, GPU boards in them. So to create a, a thousand core environment where you can do high-end processing is, would in the past for every company almost be prohibited. Um, the reason why, for example, GP, GPUs, the general purpose GPU processing didn't take off was because many companies didn't dare to invest because they didn't know where this was going. So but now suddenly providing these as a cloud service allows everyone to start experimenting with these services. And we see at the same time that this, that drives a whole level of innovation at the algorithmic level, at the application building level. So suddenly every company can start making use of these services and can become data driven where they would be, that would have been prohibited before. But buying a cluster, a 64 node HPC cluster, what do we call a departmental size cluster, would have been often of such cost that a, a department would have had to live with that for five or six years, always be oversubscribed, and um, never, never have to be able to wait. So now you never have to wait anymore. You can do the, the most modern processors. Um, so we see a completely revolution in, in how analytics is being done because it's, it's accessible for everybody at, at the same time. Very interesting. So just, just to add, I think, uh, well, first of all, we're, we're a big customer. Right? So, uh, uh, you know, typically to, to align, for example, a, a human genome takes about a thousand CPU hours. So, so what we do is essentially work off the EC2 and, and get it done in a couple of hours if, uh, you know, if you can get the right number of processors going. So it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, and on the open source side, I think, uh, I noticed you had R up there, and we had actually cross-compiled R into our platform in 2004, and, you know, it's just brilliant. Uh, I mean, you do uh, almost any statistical uh, test that you need to run, and uh, so, so absolutely, I think, uh, you know, I'm also uh, one of the creators of the computer, so, <laughs> so I've been an open source advocate for, sure. for many, many years. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so what, you know, what we are seeing in analytics and decision sciences is, the evolution that IT took from 1992 to 2000, uh, you know, the, the maturity of IT that happened in that time frame, we think that analytics and decision sciences will go through that same, same kind of maturity over the next five to seven years. Now, what is interesting we feel is that decision sciences is about how people make decisions. And you are expected to make decisions from a rational perspective, but that's not how human beings work. People make decisions. Uh, in a very rational way. I can take my marriage, for example, was a very rational decision, more for my wife than for me. But uh, what do you see in, in this world where behavioral economics is going to play a bigger role, where how people make decisions and what human biases are, the study of that is going to play a bigger role. Is Amazon bothered about that? Because you know you want to be bothered about the fact that you know the choices that you give your customers, people are going to make those right choices. Or are you not bothered about that? No, we're not bothered by it at all. Actually, so no, the reason, no. So as long as you keep um, your motto at hand, is for us, we want to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. That means that all decisions that we make are in context of doing the absolute best for the co for the customer. In many cases, we have. Uh, cannibalize our own business to actually uh, do the, wrong, the right long-term decision for the customer. So in that sense, I mean, as much as that we do behavioral and analytics, of course, because we understand how our customers buy, after 15 years, we have a pretty good understanding about um, the emotional uh, surroundings also of how customers make buying decisions. It's not a matter of actually manipulating your customers into buying something that they actually don't really want to. Because that is, in that way, you will lose your customer mm -hmm. uh, in, in the end. It is more important to help your customers not to make the buying decision 
which is, is actually not really what they want. What they want yeah? And so for us, it is really to use this insight into customers and into maybe um, how customers are like other customers to make, to help them make the right decision. Um, instead of using these behavioral techniques to manipulate them into something. Sure, sure. I want to talk about one... Just, word, just yeah. one quick comment that I think rather than behavioral economics, I think we should be talking about experimental economics. And, and again, thinking about data-driven, uh, you know, economics. So again, uh, freakonomics is, is sort of the paradigm there. And uh, so, so I think that's uh, not such a yeah, depressing... Yeah, absolutely, question. absolutely. Right. See, we, you know, now, uh, Vijay, you're in, the, you're in the intersection of uh, life sciences and analytics. You're in the intersection of biology and statistics. Do you think that you're going to see a lot more convergence happening between, you know, various applied math techniques. Do you think that there is, you're going to see far more uh, cross-pollination between various industry verticals? Are you seeing that trend? Are you being asked to solve problems based on your understanding of bioinformatics in places that you would not even have thought of? Um, you know, I, I, I do think there's, uh, there is a, an abstract level at which you can be trained and think about these problems, um, which then allows you to work on a multitude of domains. And uh, and again, you know, go, going back to what I was saying earlier, I think when you were trained in system theory or in operations research or in AI, I think these these were exactly those abstract uh, tools that that helped you to to approach problems. But actually, the original training is really physics, because uh, you know uh, the physicist is sort of the, the greatest intellectual poacher that there, there is around, right? Uh, physicist is. Dr. Warner is not very happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's able to take any problem, sort of convert it into a math problem. Sure. And, and then and then start working on it. And then make it go faster than the speed of light. <laughs> 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 so, you know, so, so actually, so, um, I think it is essential to learn from other science. I think, um, for example, if I look at my own field of the very large field distributed systems, where we've learned a lot from is actually from biology. If you look at, if you look at, a number of terms of robustness in, in biology. It's all about replication. It's all about uh, uh, compartmentalization. It's all that. If you look at the list of terms that is typically used when you reason about robustness in, in biology systems, you would actually think it's about a computer system. So, um, and so there's so many things to learn. For example, from biology, using viral techniques, using epidemic techniques, using um, you know, apoptosis is a technique where your body actually kills off a billion cells each day to actually renew them. Yet we seem to be completely well functioning. Yeah? Say computer system, one server fails and we have no power anymore in this room. Uh, so there's many techniques to learn from other sciences that we can apply to the right other uh, area areas. And as such, you have to be very open-minded. And I think it's essential to be open-minded to be able to drive your business forward without locking yourself into one domain. That's a great way to finish this off. Be open-minded, do the math, <laughs> and make sure that you think of decision sciences as a new way of thinking about problem solving as a product or as a service. I'd like to entertain some questions from the audience. I'm sure they have some questions for all of us. Yeah, go ahead, please. What, what exactly is it going to enable? Okay, we are going to, let's say we invest yeah, lots of time and, and um, we put the education there behind uh, these decision sciences and analytics. And we have, a, let's say we have 100,000 people who are trained in this. So what is it going to enable? I, I, can, I can take that very quickly and then I'll let uh, one of these two guys talk, talk about it. I think it's going to, uh, you know, big thing it's going to enable is making the markets a lot more efficient. The right things are going to happen faster 
quicker, more often for people leading to less wastage. I think that's how I look at it from a mega trend perspective. If you if, if, if people can make better decisions, there's going to be less wastage. If you're going to be spending less on marketing, the consumer surplus can be increased. So that's how I would think of it. Dr. Werner, what is your perspective? Uh, so something I mentioned earlier, I think one of the big trends that we already see in the whole uh, young business creation is that um, where in the past businesses, if even four or five years ago, uh, first of all, you needed a, a large pot of money to start off with. You would build your product, you would work two years on your product, then you would release a full featured product hoping that your customers would actually like it. I think we see a complete reversal of that, that process where, you know, using cloud and open source technologies, you no longer need any capital up front. You deliver a minimal viable product really fast and then you use analytics to very quickly drive that process, product in the direction where your customers really want it to and where you just, just can have maximum impact on your customers. That is something that I think is a completely um, a departure from how we did things and we will see those same processes that's what I feel with it, coming back in enterprises. They are starting business units with the end of enterprises because of the, the pressure on time to market is actually are starting to follow those same patterns. Uh, just to uh, uh, give my little uh, vision there, I think it's, uh, I think you're going to see dramatic changes in healthcare, and, and particularly in this country. Uh, I think we don't have some of the uh, regulatory issues and legacy issues that the West has, which is sort of slowing down reform in healthcare, but you're going to see amazing changes in healthcare in this country in the next five to ten years. And a lot of that is going to be driven by analytics. The question from? We see that being made use of. But before the analytics, you need the data, right? And I'm sure uh, one of was talking about uh, uh, you know, the US government making all the data available at a portal for anybody to consume and match up with whole bunch of other things. Why are we not seeing this in our, uh, let's say, our government, right? Be it uh, uh, police uh, uh, data, crime rate, various things, uh, you know, happening so that you know, or maybe it's the traffic data that is not being. Why is it not, you know, being made available as a data, so that you know you could probably uh, leverage our short uh, uh, resources of police force could be probably put in one place, or maybe the whole data of the crime rate, you know, could be better made use uh, uh, in places where you know maybe a lot of awareness about that, or maybe mo again more police force, but. Why the whole basic idea of I, getting that? What catalyst we are missing? Right. I, I, I think we're in the early stages of actually seeing that happen. Uh, I think the RTI and its impact, uh, you know, you're actually seeing data that's starting to get collected. Uh, there are, you know, for example, our traffic uh, in Bangalore is overseen by Praveen Sood and he uses a lot of analytics. Uh, he actually, you know, has monitoring systems and, and he's actually watching traffic uh, congestion centers and giving advice on, on how to relieve the traffic pattern. That, and so I think you'll see a lot more of it happening. I think the, the data had, had been withheld for, for, for a long time. And I think part of the, uh, the beauty of the RTI is that uh, you know, all of this data is going to become more and more open. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Quick question. Sure, you, know, you, you mentioned about a behavioral economics throughout your talk, and Professor Chandra, you said it should be experimental analytics for a data driven. Could you just bring out that fine line of a distinction you had when you suggested that change? Well, behavioral economics could be game theory, right? Uh, and, you know, the theories of rational man going back to von Neumann. So it's a, re it's a very old, old subject. But experimental economics is more of this data driven. Can I go with this? A quick question. One question, yeah. one or anything like that. Thanks, Viraj. Uh, Viraj, you spoke about uh, creation and consumption of analytics. Very well put. Uh, now, do you think usability uh, of analytic tools is a concern? Absolutely. Uh, from, from two perspectives. One is that you're talking about shortage of analytic talent. That's one thing. So, democratize it and make, it, make sure that more people can learn it. And the other is, from the client perspective, where I would love to have perspectives from Dr. Werner as well as Mr. Raju. Um, you know, usability is a big issue, right? And you're also, you also talked about how software has changed in terms of UI. Do you think a paradigm shift is required for analytical tools? Uh, absolutely. You know, we have something in our company. We say uh, for anything that we produce in the, dis the descriptive analytics area, we say, do you have UV protection? Uh, do you have UV protection stands for 
do you have usability and visualization? Uh, and we think that uh, you know the human computer interaction, understanding of how people, the functional aspect of how people are going to use tools is going to play a big, big part. Uh, anything from? Oh, absolutely. I think visualization is, is, is a big part of uh, everything we do. And uh, you know, being able to look at a genome, which is three billion letters long, and being able to look at a million mutations within that three billion, uh, you know, sequence is uh, is a huge challenge in visualization. And uh, and that's what we worry about all the time. Right. I, I mean, I'll be here to take questions. Dr. Verna, thanks a lot. Vijay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs>